Hello, welcome to Poets Speak. My name is Char Denord, and I'm very happy to have Lee Bramble here today. He served as president of Marlboro College from 1968 to 1981. He holds an AB in Ancient Greek History and Literature from Harvard University, and a master's degree in English Language and Literature from Oxford University. He's the author of a book of poetry titled Take This Song, and he serves on the board of Right Action, a nonprofit organization formed to nurture, encounter, and promote the literary arts in the larger Brattleboro community. He also, for many years, hosted a program devoted to poetry on Brattleboro's community radio station, WVEW. In addition to writing poetry throughout his life, Lee has traveled widely around the world and served for many years as the director of the Salzburg Seminar in Austria. This gives me a great pleasure to introduce uh, Tom Regel today, and uh, who is also known as Lee Bramble. Your pen name is Lee Bramble. That's correct. And yes. um, I. Um, have known you for uh, quite some time as Tom Regal, uh, but i um, happy to uh, recognize you as Lee Bramble, the author of this uh, wonderful book called uh, Take This Song. I was wondering if you could just um, start talking to us a little bit about uh, your ideas for writing poetry. There's so much to talk about as far as your career and as far as your, uh, your writing, as far as your scholarship. Um, but I know that you've thought long and hard about um, writing and, your, um, and the reasons behind your writing. So uh, and I know you might want to you know, read this little prepared statement you have here. Uh, yes, but let me give a little background to that. Sure. I moved to Vermont in 1958 to write poetry seriously mm -hmm. and earn a living any way I could. Mm -hmm. Something happened on the way to the forum, and I found myself president of Marlboro College for 23 years. I needed so much energy and had so little time while I was at Marlboro, I didn't write anything for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so when I left in uh, 1981, I recognized that you don't stop practicing the violin and then go back on the stage in Carnegie Hall. I started writing poetry again, and I realized I was writing it for myself. And I developed in a certain direction, I will read this credo of what mm. I'm trying to do, because I do not write the default poetry of the age, which I describe as unmusical and existential in Sartre's sense, that is existence before essence. I do not mean to dismiss such poetry, only to say it is different, has its own virtues and shortcomings. I am the one out of step with it, deliberately. Wordsworth has a famous saying about emotion recollected in tranquility. I speak rather of felt experience recollected in tranquility, and then mind for deeper meaning. My poems are initially about real existential events at the time, initially, events, people, or places, but then I try to see them in the context of life as a whole, with meaning, because I believe life has overall meaning. And the better we understand that meaning, the better lives we can lead. When I step back and examine the corpus later, I detect patterns and connections which go beyond the initial existential experience. If I may coin a word, I'm an essentialist. My poems might be considered as a post-hole autobiography of felt experience as contrasted to practical experience, an interrelated related collection of felt experiences, personal or vicarious, which define the person I have become and the world as I see it. Hmm. Well, thank you for reading that. Um, I know that you've um, written intermittently, through, as you just mentioned, throughout your, your career, um, waiting sometimes years and years for poems to come to you, usually first lines that you then uh, develop. Uh, uh, I can't write a poem unless I have the first line which sets the tempo and the key. Mm. Uh, I may have a subject I want to write on and I may have it in my mind for many years before that line comes. Mm. Carl Jung has a, an essay once on poetry, of course he's talking about German poetry, continental poetry, uh, in which he divides poetry into two kinds that which is written out of the conscious mind, 
and that which is written out of the unconscious mind. I am very definitely of the latter kind. I can't write to a prompt mm. uh, when I do that, and I've tried it. Mm. I write trash. Mm. Right. Well, can you, would you mind uh, reading a poem for us? All right. Um, I'll read a couple of related poems. Okay. When we were living in Austria, my wife and I, we had a Saluki dog. Now, Salukis are trained, brought up to chase gazelle. They're very fast, very beautiful. They don't run, they float. And one day I took Kiwi, the name of the dog, out in the park. It was the first warm day of spring, and she caught spring fever. She ran around in circles, chased her tail, jumped over a bush, jumped over a, uh, a, uh, a stream. And I went inside, having caught the spring fever myself, and I wrote this. You do not run like the wind, puffing without rhythm. Now like the surf upon the shore, pounding, pounding, but like moonlit ripples on the pond in the light air of spring, or a wren's trill by the garden in the early light. You run like the brook in Schubert's song, singing in the sun, not bound to the earth, but youth bounding in the warm holiday air. I love you like this, unconcerned, the elements fused into song. But if I can relate to the animal in the spring fever. What about other aspects in which we relate, say, to animals, because we are also animals? Well, I set out one year to write an obad. An obad is a morning or dawn song. It's a famous one by John Donne, in which two lovers are awakened by the sun and curse it because it's interrupted their liaison. Well, I was setting out to write Nabad to celebrate dawn because I love the dawn. Everything's downhill after breakfast. <coughs> and I used to walk, I still do, in the pastures around our house. <coughs> and then I come back and I feed the birds and eat breakfast. Well, I was in the middle of writing this poem when 9-11 happened. And the poem took a 180 degree turn on me. Mm. You never know when you start a poem where it's going to end up. It's called Obad. It's in two parts. In the early morning clarity of air, after walking in the pastures with a dog, I tend to the birds outside the kitchen window. Each year birds about the feeders fix the pecking order. Starling and grackle feed together like two rival gangs, but they drive away the evening grosbeak, titmouse, nuthatch, chickadee, and wren. Dove and blue jay seem to mix together, the handsome red-winged blackbird sometimes too, Blue jays sweeping seed from feeder to the ground where cardinals and pigeons peck it up. Woodpeckers ignore the rest, hairy and downy upside down, swinging from the chain, attacking suet when they will. Shy yet daring goldfinch flit, nervous, not waiting till the others leave to pinch the thistle from the plastic tubes. Bluebirds like swallows keep their distance, circling or perching on the back lawn fence. Through all, chipmunks dart about among, as do squirrels, red and gray alike, grazing for seed the raucous jays kick down. Yet in the evening sky the hawk hovers, and even jays must watch, no longer kings, and chipmunks watch for the tawny yellow cat that wild issues from the woods, and silently, alone, stalks the dawn and evening dusks. Like a hawk hovering high against the morning sun, it floated there, hardly moving. No sound at such a distance above a city waking. Just brilliant silver flashes in the clear sky. Then it banked, aimed, struck, bright orange edged in black, splashed against that lovely sky. As though a dam had burst, as though before the Spanish bulls, people running, running, running through the cameras, through the screen, at us. Mm. Now, if we share spring fever mm. with the animal and we share the lust of the, rapt of the raptor, where does compassion come, empathy? Well, I set out one time to write a triptych fragment, three poems about the same theme, like the paintings over late Gothic churches in Europe. And Baroque came along, they were taken down, many of them are found now, and 
museum walls in Europe, sometimes all three, and sometimes just in fragments. I wrote a full triptych, three parts, broke out one because it wasn't good enough, it didn't fit, and I'll read just one of the other remaining two. It's called Intifada, after the uh, first Intifada in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. In the early desert light, the engines ground and coughed into rhythm. The flatbeds began the slow trek through the ancient alleys into the hills, disturbing the air with raucous echoes to the villagers muffled at first, then throbbing steadily nearer to the sedentary huts squatting on the stony ground. They stopped. The noise ceased, except for muffled voices and the rattle of chains drawn against metal. The private climbed the seat. Slowly the dozer cranked into the diesel chuckle. The dozer lurched to the desert floor and swung through the narrow alley. Third on the right, round the corner, the lieutenant called, striding behind, waving his hand vaguely in air. The dozer, setting its right tread, spun round the corner and stopped. Five feet from a family crouching on the hard ground beside their breakfast fire. An old woman, a young woman, an infant in her arms, three children. They rose slowly and stared without moving. The breakfast, unconcerned, cooked on, the smoke curling lazily into the still, cold desert air, the smell of coffee and a fresh flatbread. They stared, the private stared, their eyes met, he switched the engine off, the rumble ceased. Slowly he rose from his seat, climbed down and walked away, back by the stunned officer, back to his flatbed trailer, and crouched on his haunches, staring toward the stony hills. That, by the way, was told to me by the private who was by then out of the army and was a fellow at the Salzburg Seminar. Mm. I'm, I'm struck by your objective view of, this, of, the, of the scene, of, of actually all, all in all the three poems, your, um, what Keats would call disinterested observation, um, which doesn't mean uninterested, of course, it simply means ob objective, um, which is nonetheless causing you to feel, as, as you say in your credo, a felt meaning and felt experience, ironically. Yes. Um, actually, I am recreating the feelings as though I were there at the time, even if it's a vicarious, mm -hmm. as in the uh, Intifada one, mm -hmm. uh, I am recreating them. Uh, as I say, I sometimes think of my poems as a post hall of experience throughout my life. Mm. Uh, you asked earlier, uh, before, we were before the program, we were talking about felt experience. And let me read a sure. passage from the introduction to my poems. I use the term felt experience to distinguish it from practical experience. Both are needed to live fully. In the latter, one learns over a period of time what to expect or how to do something better. How better to milk a cow or make a wedge widget to hit a baseball or remove an appendix, how to earn a living and survive. In the former, one expands one's feelings, one's ability to feel, to respond to life, what it feels like to milk a cow or make a widget. One might even say, to feel life, to live completely. Such feeling, I believe, influences not only one's actions, but one's values, even helps create one's values. Ask biologists what death is, and they will talk in terms of what happens to the metabolism. Ask poets, and they will speak in terms of what it feels like to die, or to watch someone else die. As in Emily Dickinson's, I heard a fly buzz when I died, or in Frost's, out, out. Yeah, wonderful. You know, I'm, I'm fascinated by uh, your um, thinking about poetry and your own, own writing. Um, you've taken on the pen name Lee Bramble um, many, many years ago when you were 15 and a high school student at Exeter after a teacher uh, chastised you for writing poetry that he, didn't, um, he apparently didn't, didn't like. 
Um, and you, you've been kind of, seems to me, writing poetry almost as a secret discipline ever since, um, but putting another name to it, yeah, Lee Bramble, which is a, f a family name, but it's not your given name, Tom Ragel. Well, actually, the teacher trashed that poem properly. It was a bad poem. It was an Edgar Gestian poem. Does that name mean anything to you? Oh, yes, yes. Well, it was that kind. Um, a very rhymey poem. Very yeah. rhymey uh, newspaper poet, really. Right, right. And uh, so I immediately went underground, so nobody would, would injure me that way again, um, and picked up Lee Bramble, which was, my mother wanted my middle name to be Lee, a family name. My father wanted it to be Bramble, and I think he won because I was a boy, not a girl. Um, I started writing poetry seriously, or for that age, seriously, at about that age, 15. But uh, I never really focused on it. I knew I would someday until 1958, I think it was, I quit a teaching job and moved to Vermont to write poetry seriously and earn a living any way I could. Uh, something happened on the way to the forum. <laughs> Uh, Can I interrupt I, I, you for a second? Yeah. You came to Vermont to write poetry because I guess it's, you thought of it as a very kind of idyllic state and a you know a perfect environment for writing poetry. Uh, I, I had worked uh, here in 1942 up on Lake Champlain, yeah, uh, in what is now Shelburne Farms, is then the Webb Estate, with two English war refugees, uh -huh. and I fell in love with this state, and I vowed then I was going to return someday. Right. And, and so, you loved you loved Robert Frost also, who you met a few times and did his um, association with Vermont have anything? No, to do? I don't think so. I think um, it was more that summer in 1942. Mm -hmm. um, but I came to write poetry seriously, and then became president of a college, and I had neither the energy nor the time to write poetry, not seriously, writing poetry can be exhausting. Mm. And within three years, I was a single parent with a five-year-old and a three-year-old. Mm. And so I didn't start again till 20 years later. I left Marlboro in 81. And you don't go on the stage at Carnegie Hall if you haven't practiced the yeah. violin for 20 years. So I started writing poetry for myself. Yeah. Going back through things that had influenced me emotionally right. and try to capture, recapture mm. and reproduce and perhaps mm. communicate that to others. Did you ever feel that you'd waited a little too long to capture some of those experiences, 20, 20 well, years? Well, I probably would president? be technically a better poet if I'd been practicing those 20 years. Uh -huh. But actually, I think it was the best mistake I ever made because I got experiences mm -hmm. living in Europe, living in Asia, mm -hmm. uh, administering a college and things like this mm -hmm. that gives my poetry, I think, more substance mm -hmm. than if I just sat down as a poet to write. I think it was Coleridge who said, if you're going to be a poet, take up something else to get experience right. and then write the poetry. And I think I had that in the back of my mind. Right, right. Uh, the story of your becoming president of Marlboro College is, is, is fascinating. I mean, you came, as you said, to write poetry in Vermont, uh, but ended up applying uh, to a few colleges, Bennington, Marlboro, and there was Middlebury, one. Middlebury, UVM. And you got jobs, you got job offers at all three. But not in time. Uh, I applied in the fall. Right. Marlboro told me at the time that they had used up their budget for the next year. I see. Come back again. Uh-huh. Uh, I was coming back from an interview at Bennington one March, warm, hot March day. I was very thirsty, and I suddenly saw the sign to the back road to Marlboro, Town Hill Road, and I thought, I'm usually not this crafty, I thought maybe if I knock on the dean's door, he'll offer me a cup of tea, and I can use as an excuse, has anything changed? I didn't assume anything had. I did that, he invited me in for a cup of tea, I then asked the question, has anything changed? And he said, the only opening is the presidency. <laughs> uh, I paused and I thought a minute, I still didn't have a job. And I said, well, if I could have more to do with the academic program than presidents are supposed to, I might consider it. Mm -hmm. Well, a month later I was appointed. And the irony is that within two weeks, I had tenure uh, positions offered to me 
um, at both Middlebury and Bennington, either of which I would have taken, rather than mm -hmm. being president of Marlboro College. I had no experience as an administrator, mm -hmm. but it was too late. Best uh, mistake I ever made. Yeah, and you, and you were there at a, a very exciting time. Uh, Roland Boyden was there, whose grandson helped set up this studio. Um, John MacArthur was there. Bruce uh, Moise was there. Bruce Moise. So, uh, and, and this was during a time when Bar Marlboro wasn't even accredited yet, right? Uh, when I was uh, actually appointed, though I hadn't taken office, the college had 27 students. But it had a core of the faculty which was outstanding. Two-thirds of the leading flute trio in the world, uh, Roland Boyden, the greatest man in the early history of the college without question, who had both a law degree from Harvard and a doctorate in English history from Harvard, John MacArthur, who was a, a, a physicist from Rensselaer, mm -hmm. and so on. It was the quality of that faculty that attracted me. Yeah. And uh, the point was to keep going the professional integrity and personal integrity which these people had established. Yeah. And then you oversaw the accreditation process in the early 60s. Yeah, we built the campus. Yeah. We got accredited. We grew from that 27 to over 200 mm. by the time I left. Right. Um, and this whole time, you were thinking about writing poetry, but didn't have time that's to. That's right. I didn't have the time and the energy. Uh, then I got a, an appointment to Aspen Institute in Colorado about mm -hmm. 1980, I think mm -hmm. it was. And they gave us two weeks afterwards, after mm -hmm. we'd been to the, the sessions, to do anything we wanted. Yeah. And so I said, well, I wonder if I can still write a poem. <laughs> and I started and it picked up. Yeah. It's, I guess I became most active when I retired in 1993. That's when the 90s and early mm. 2000s were my most right. productive time. Then you became director of the Salzburg Seminars. From 83 to 88. 83 to 88, yes. okay, before that. And yeah. th that was interesting because I traveled all over Eastern Europe and part of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Again, picking up experience out of which mm -hmm. I could later write poems. And you were involved with the United Nations Development Program in China for several years. Yes, I was uh, a special consultant on the teaching of English literature at the university level. Mm -hmm. And each week I would teach in three different universities or colleges uh, to show me what education was like in China so I get a sense of it. Right. And then lecturing in a fourth college once a month. Right. And this was right after, in fact, I was on my way to China for a preliminary interview when Tiananmen Square happened. Mm -hmm. So when I came back in September, it was right mm -hmm. after that incident. and. China was a very interesting country at that time. I bet, I bet. Um, so um, you've, you've been very patient in waiting for your muse to strike you with lightning. Well, I can't write a poem till I have the first line. Mm. And uh, I think I mentioned the, the, the Carl Jung. Yes, the, your, and your unconscious inspiration. Yeah, and, and, and when I don't get that first line, I can't write. Mm. Um, most of my writing was before uh, 2012. I didn't write for three years, and then in one year, three poems came to me, mm. and nothing has come since uh, wow. 2015 or so. Yeah. Now, when you say poems come to you, first lines come to you, is, are these lines um, that, that um, uh, you wake up with, or some, something someone said, or something no, you've can, read? Or, or It might be I wake up to them, but mostly they come to me. Let me, um, if, we have, if we have time here, mm -hmm. uh, if I can find it. Um, I thought I had it right here. Well, I'm not finding it. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, there was one poem I, oh, here it is. Uh, this is the last poem that came to me, and unlike most of mine, which take two or three hours, maybe over two or three days yeah. to, to get into shape. This took me eight months. This is hard work. But the first line came to me one day and I didn't know where the poem was going. It's called The Letting Go. And now begins the long, slow letting go. So many images, so many, 
back to that first beginnings in a pen outline dimly, standing on a country summer porch, memory looking outside in, reversing truth as in a looking glass. Where will that image go when I am gone? Thunder, lightning rippling in the sky, calmly my father takes me in his arms and shows me cosmic beauty in the night. Warm in his arms, kin to the elements, thunder has never held a fear for me. Where will that image go when I am gone? Running, hiding, turning, laughing, facing the rising sun, early that golden spring underneath the blossoming apple tree, she playing Eve to my embarrassed youth, excited by that ancient game, the dance. Where will that image go when I am gone? A warm, ripe, early August afternoon, tiny blue dress, blue air, blonde hair, a giggle whirling in the air above my back to the ground, lifting the air within until I float, happy with unself-interested love. Where will that image go when I am gone? Such is my life now, outside looking in, pondering, assessing, evaluating what, how, when events which now stare back at me felt at the time, affected all I was and am. The was and am, I sense, are not the same. In the dimness of my age, arthritic back and thumb, weary after lunch, I nod, reading the paper, sunning on the couch, curling into myself and drifting off until no longer am I separate. Yes, now begins a long, slow letting go, back through those images to what I was before I came, holding on as though this life and I were all that ever was. I am a part of all that ever was. Images dim, fold within my being, become myself, follow me where I go, still a part of what has always been before the deepest seabed worm began to dream itself into more future life. The early morning mist lit from below where the autumn fire burns a faint blush pink, rolls on itself and fades. Today comes stark, chill, clear like a mountain spring until it fades into a night we cannot pierce. At the last will come that day when I shall ride the earth into the morning sun and light like the coming tide washes the hours abroad, faint though they be now, till the retreating tide pulls the dark hood over my failing sense, and I drift into that primal peace I knew before I knew. Mm, very nice. Thank you. That's the last poem you wrote. Last major poem I wrote. Three yes. years ago. Yeah. I'd write tomorrow if something comes. Well, what, why don't you just force yourself to write? <laughs> Whenever I sit down to write. See what comes. I write trash. I've had you, too much experience with that. You're, you're pretty hard on yourself. All right. Yeah. I don't want to write trash. There yeah. are people who sit down every day and mm. write for two hours. Mm. And I think if you're a novelist, that's, that works. Mm -hmm. um, and it works for some poets. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work for me. Do you, do you think um, your classical education, you studied Greek literature, and you also studied, um, he majored in that uh, in, at Harvard. Yeah. And then you went on to Oxford and um, majored in um, English literature and especially loved Wordsworth and um, uh, Frost, I think, right? I think Wordsworth and Frost probably yeah. influenced me yeah. more than any other. Well, do you think that, that that high standard of writing, of their writing, of these influences, um, intimidated you a little bit? Did you feel that unless I... Didn't intimidate me, it just gave me a goal. A goal, right. But yeah. a pretty high goal, right? Yes. Um, and uh, so it, it must have been tough sometimes to think about even writing a poem if you had their poetry in mind as, as a goal or as a model for your own writing. Well, I, I love poetry. Um, my father, when I was four, five, six years old, I'd lie in bed next to him in the evening before I went to sleep, and he would read me little rhymes. Mm -hmm. Like, I let a little elf, met a little elf man once down with the poppies blow. I asked him why he was so small and why he didn't grow. He looked at me with his big round eyes that pierced me through and through. I'm just as big to me, he said, as you are big to you. <laughs> and then one day, he started with, um, Something there is that does not love a wall, that sends the frozen, gro frozen ground swell under it. And I was off and running. Uh -huh. um, 
I love poets. People say to me, who's your favorite English poet? Mm. And my first answer is, it depends on which day you ask. Mm -hmm. But there are certain favorites, like Wordsworth, like Frost, like Hopkins. Very mm -hmm. different. I couldn't write like Hopkins, but I, mm -hmm. I love to read him. He's uh, mm -hmm. the most beautiful uh, yes. orally. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love poets from all, all generations, and I, 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 far below their standards, but I mm -hmm. yearn for their standards. Mm -hmm. So, so all of these years, especially those 20 years that you were uh, working as president of Marlborough College, you had poetry in your head and you were probably reciting it. I was it teaching it. And too. teaching it and thinking about it, um, but not, but not, write, but not, write, not writing, writing it. No. Um, um, I'm cu very curious also about something you said early on in the interview here. You, you said that um, you um, uh, used the word default. Could you repeat that, that line? Um, it's in your credo, I, I think. Oh, uh, I think that much, I, I get, for instance, the daily poem from the Poetry Foundation. Poetry Academy, or Foundation, Foundation Two. Foundation, right, they do it too, yes. Thing. Uh -huh. And I don't wish to dismiss that poetry, or, or, yeah. or much of that poetry, because yeah. it has its own standards. It's doing things differently. Right. But first of all, a high percentage of it is not what I call musical. Mm. Rhythmical, which is essential to me. Poetry began in song and chant. Yeah. And so verbal music is very important to you, obviously. Obviously. Yeah. Yes. And also, it's existential in the sense that I don't think the poets, most of them, some of them do, are mining that experience they're describing mm -hmm. of taking a walk in the woods and mm -hmm. the woods are beginning to flower with spring or something. Mm -hmm. They don't take it further. Mm -hmm. They're not looking to see how that fits into the rest of life. Hmm. And this is what I want to do. None of the poems that I write is written with another poem in mind. Mm -hmm. But if you stand back and look at them, you mm -hmm. begin to see the connection between Kiwi mm -hmm. and Obad mm -hmm. and Intifada, mm -hmm. because I'm seeing life as a whole and how it interrelates. Right. So the way you moved from the animal, your dog, in that first poem, uh, to um, uh, ultimately to that uh, human compassion that you, you mentioned. Yeah. Um, in your la last poem, so that there is this a progression or a dialectic that has occurred throughout most of your work? Yes, um, the subtitle I think of this book mm -hmm. is called "In Pursuit of Meaning." Uh -huh. Everything I write is in pursuit of meaning, whether it's an es a theological essay, a philosophical essay, mm -hmm. a literary essay, a lecture, mm -hmm. a short story, mm -hmm. a poem. Mm -hmm. uh, of those, the one that interests me most oddly, is poetry, hmm. the one I would wish most to excel in, but... I, I was going to say, that's a, it sounds a little ironic, uh, that, yeah, that, that poetry is the one that interests you the most. Uh, well, that's the most intimidating. So is that what it is? Yeah, when, yeah. You're, when you're writing a poem and you're trying to write at a high level, which mm. you may not achieve, mm. uh, maybe I'm intimidated by that teacher years ago, I don't know. It stayed with you. Stayed with me. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there are, you know, there still are contemporary poets who write in, very formally and who, for whom yes. verbal music is is obviously still very important. But you have to search for it, uh, or and you don't. Yeah, there's a minority see, of poets. You don't see it enough. Uh, yeah. I've, for your taste. My own education, ironically, Oxford ended its uh, its education in eight, 1832 with the death of Sir Walter Scott. Why not 1834 with the death of Coleridge, I don't know. But I've had to train myself in literature from then to the modern time, and I finally reached the point of <coughs> reading a lot of William Carlos Williams at the moment. Oh, well. And uh, it's very different. Yeah. And I've had to come to terms with that, but I admire him very much uh, for what he was doing. It's not what I'm doing. Right. So you 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 do you do find something fascinating about Williams, even though he um, isn't as musical a poet as yes. many of the others That's you've right. mentioned. I think you know I can't write haiku because I can't make them musical. I've written a couple, but mm -hmm. they're no good. Um, we are not Jap speaking Japanese now. Japanese has no stress. Right. And haiku comes from Japan, yeah, yeah. where stress is not the issue. Right. It's the subject matter, nature, yeah. or whatever it is. Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of contemporary poetry is unmusical, and 
it has certain certain insights. Some of them are very deep, mm -hmm. and I learn from them. Mm -hmm. I wish they didn't call them poems. I wish there were another name yeah. for it. What, 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 what is it about William's poetry that appeals to you? Uh, because I'll, um, it's, it's very... His ability to see, to make you look at the ordinary. Uh -huh. You look at the ordinary and you see it. Uh, maybe you, you it. see it every day, yeah. but you see it and feel it. So much depends upon a red wheelbarrow beside the chickens glazed with rainwater. Yeah. Just something as simple and, and, and visual as that. I can't quote a, the wonderful poem, which I, I should have brought with me, in which you say, poetry is song, or should be song. Mm -hmm. And in the way you read it, he refuses to let you read it as song. Mm -hmm. because of the way he's broken his lines and so the forth. The variable foot, he called it's, it's it. A, yeah, it's a brilliant, it's yeah. a brilliant piece of, of and, uh, defense the, of that kind of poetry. The notion of no ideas but in things, as he, yeah. as he yeah. also said. Yeah, exactly. so that's curious that he's broken through to, for you. Yes, he has in a way a lot of other poets have not. Yeah, uh, yeah. But it's not, it's later than him. The poets that are writing today, mm -hmm. uh, so existential, something happens to them and they describe it very well and some of the insights mm -hmm. are profound. Mm -hmm. I see that, mm -hmm. but it doesn't sing. Mm -hmm. So to me, it isn't poetry. Yeah, so that, that, you know, that's interesting. Um, that, that the free verse of poetry since the early 60s has become a pretty predominant form in American poetry. But free verse can be highly musical. Look at yeah. Whitman. Oh yeah. You, he sings. Yeah. But it's free verse. I write in free verse. It's meter making argument. I write, I write both in free verse uh -huh. and in blank verse and, and similar forms. Right, I see. Yeah. So do you think you'll write again? Do you think you've got another poem or two in you? I have no idea. Uh, so you said this one took eight months. To, yeah, to but write. normally that, 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 when I retired, we retired in June, and it took us until Thanksgiving to get the house back in shape. Mm -hmm. And I sat down, I said, now at last I can write a poem. This was 1982. No, this was 1993. Oh, 93, okay. When I retired totally, I was, completely. I was thinking when you finished your stint Ma as head yeah, president. Mama. Yeah. No, this was when I retired permanently. Uh -huh. And I sat down and I wrote a poem, MWR, about my mother. Mm -hmm. And I realized that that poem must have been sort of incubating down in my unconscious for 16 years. Mm -hmm. But I wrote it off in two hours maximum. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it had been sitting there, yeah. and, and there it was. Yeah. But this last poem I read, uh, The Letting Go, I had to labor, I had to work. Mm -hmm. And I was afraid at the end, maybe it would sound too labored. Mm -hmm. No, you read it, you read it very well. It's just yeah, beautiful. It seems yeah. to work out, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and we haven't mentioned that you raised an enormous family the whole time you were president well, of Marlboro this, and, and even after. This is a factor, I guess, in why I wasn't writing poetry, because shepherding a tiny, struggling, unaccredited college took all my time and energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, then within three years, I was a single father with a five and a three-year-old. And then I remarried uh, four years later or so mm. with a woman who had four children. So overnight, we had four ch uh, six children between the ages of 10 and six. One of whom was Bill Koch. Yes. The silver One. medalist of the 1976 the, Olympics in cross-country skiing. Yeah, the only, the only American to win a medal in the Olympics in cross-country until this last winter. Mm -hmm. And I may add this, that when the two women won, a gold. Yes. He was so delighted he was crying and laughing at the same time <laughs> because the the burden was off his back. He yep. wasn't the only one. He uh, likes to fly under the radar. Uh huh. And people wouldn't make so much fuss over him again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Tom, we've run out of time. Um, do you like me to call? Would you like me to call you Lee or Tom? You can call me Tom. Tom. Okay. But when I'm a poet, I okay. am Lee. Okay. Well, Tom, it's been wonderful to hear the poetry you've written under the pen name Lee. Okay. Bramble and to talk to you and I wish you all the best and many more poems. Thank you very much and you're making a very good state poet. Oh, thank you very much.